the Happy Scientist Podcast. Each episode is designed to make you more focused, more productive, and more satisfied in the lab. You can find us online at bitesizebio.com slash happy scientist. Your hosts are Kenneth Vogt, founder of the executive coaching firm Vera Claritas, and Dr. Nick Oswald, PhD, bioscientist, and founder of Bite Size Bio. Hello, this is Nick Oswald welcoming you to this Bite Size Bio webinar, which today is a live episode of the Happy Scientist podcast. If you want to become a happier, healthier, and more productive scientist, this is the place for you. With me, as always, is the Bite Size Bio team's Mr. Miyagi, Mr. Kenneth Bolt. In these sessions, we hear from Ken mostly on principles that will help shape you for a happier, and a more successful career. And along the way, I'll pitch in with my with points from my personal experience as a scientist and from working with Ken. If you if you have any questions along the way, put them into the questions box on the side of your screen and I will put them to Ken. Today, we will be discussing focus, your lab superpower. Okay, Ken, over to you. I stepped on your intro there and that I may have, I may have, Made a little noise there. A little lack of focus on my part. So we're gonna we're gonna deal with that right now. Focus is a uh, is is important in in any any career sense, any business sense, any operational sense. But it's particularly important in the laboratory. And I, I realize that's not news to any of y'all. Um, however, you, there are certain people in your world that are really good at focus and then there are other people that are are not good at it at all and unfortunately they span the gamut as far as what what positions they hold so you can have an extremely focused lab assistant and you can have a very unfocused pi you know or 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 phd advisor or whatever you know or and you may look at yourself that way and think, I don't know, is focus really a thing for me? Am I good at it? Am I bad at it? Am I capable, but I'm unwilling? Um, do I find focus to be an imposition on my creativity and my my opportunity to, to look outside the box, as it were? Or is it something that is just absolutely essential to be effective in your job and in your career? So that's what we're going to talk about today, focusing on your superpowers in the lab. <clears throat> so the, the first question to ask would be, why focus? Why should you bother to focus? So to give you an idea why you might want to do that, allow me to throw out some, some synonyms for unfocused. And see if any of these sound familiar to you. And if you're experiencing any of these or or if these show up in your world. Chaos. Disarray. Disorganization. Confusion. Mayhem. Bedlam. <laughs> frenzy. Turmoil. Disruption. Upheaval. And my favorite, anarchy. Now, if those are common things in your world, there, this is what being unfocused has wrought. This is where it came from. Focus is actually a solution to any and all of these things. Now, it begins with focus helps you clarify your priorities. Because if you're unfocused, it's, it's hard to tell what's important and what's not. Whereas if you're focused, importance of one thing over another becomes very, very straightforward. <clears throat> now, once you've focused on your priorities, then focus starts to attract things that are supportive of those priorities. And, and you've probably already experienced the, you know, this in your life many times and in many ways, where when you start giving something attention, all of a sudden it starts showing up. 
and you start seeing ways to uh, accomplish things. You start seeing tools that will help you. You start seeing problems for the first time. And by the way, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing because an unseen problem is a disaster. But a seen problem is not. Now it's in your awareness. Now you can do something with it. And finally, I'll say that focus draws things progressively more strongly. That is, it starts to, to take priority over other things that are happening in the environment. And a lot of things happening in your environment can be very, um, you know, they, they can demand attention. They can be very noisy. They can be very pushy. Whereas focus will help you to filter that stuff out and not be bothered by, by the noise and the bright lights and the shiny red things and all that. <laughs> so this, this is the case I make for why you should focus. Now, now that you've decided, okay, focus is going to work for me. It's useful. I think I want to do that. Um, I want to key on the notion of focus versus focusing. Now, when we add ing to a verb, it makes it the present imperfect tense. And I realize you probably didn't want a, a language lesson right now, but well, bear with me a second. Here's the issue with present imperfect tense. It's it's something that's that's ongoing and incomplete. So there's big difference between focus and focusing. Focus is complete. You are focused. It's done. Mission accomplished. Focusing is incomplete. It means you you're still working into it. You're still dialing it up, and there's nothing about any uh, present imperfect tense that requires you to actually finish it. You can remain unfocused because you're focusing. So, you know, focusing on progressing, you know, the, put that in air quotes, is a trap. Because the problem is anything can be labeled as progress, right? So there's really no incentive or any any necessity to ever complete anything. So the, what do you do with that now? Okay, if you're, if you're in a situation where you've got a complex task to get done or even a, a whole set of tasks to get done, if, if you try to focus on any individual thing, you might forget about other parts of it, right? You know, that, that's the excuse we use. Well, I have to pay attention to everything. The problem is we can't really pay attention to everything all at once. So what we have to do is we kind of have to do triage on it. We have to decide what is, in this moment, where is my focus going to be? That's got to be it. You can't be focusing on six things at once. It's not possible to do that. The focus the focus is an, an individual event, right? So rather than focusing on progressing, what you need to do in that situation is, is to start to set inter, interim goals, to set milestones that have to happen. And now... And your focus is not on the big picture at that moment. Your focus is on a particular accomplishment that needs to happen, a particular task, something that has to be completed before you can move to the next task. So this is why you want to be all about focus rather than focusing, because if you're focusing, you're patting yourself on the back. You're telling yourself you're accomplishing focus, but you're not. It's not actually getting completed. And it really matters that you can get completed. So the end point of this is what are you focused on? Are you focused on problems? Well, that's one way to approach things. Are you focused on barriers? That's another way to approach it. Are you focused on failure? Now, I presume that if someone focuses on failure, it's not because their intent is to fail. The problem is they're worried about failing. So if that's where you put your attention, then that's what you're going to draw toward yourself, as we discussed earlier. Your focus is going to draw things. Your focus is very powerful. And you know this from personal experience. This is not news to you. You've 
been doing this your whole life and you've seen it happen. You know, when you're a little kid and you got on that two wheeler for the first time and you were scared that you're going to fall down and you focused on falling down, guess what? You fell down, right? <laughs> and you have the skin need to prove it, right? You want to put your focus instead on moving forward. Focus requires you to ignore the panic. It requires you to, to set aside the worries and the anxieties. Focus is actually about gathering your will. And if you think about it as your free will is you know, all the choices that you're making and how you're going to approach what you're going to do, that is the reason why you have that, that position in the lab, because you're capable of exerting your will. If you had no, if you had no, no power to exert your will, you wouldn't be much use to anybody in the lab. You wouldn't last there very long. And, it, and that's true of any position that requires somebody to be intelligent and experienced and capable. Um, we have to exercise our will. Now, there's another interesting thing about focus. It, it's at your option. You get to choose what you're going to focus on. Now, it's true. You may have an advisor that's trying to lead you to focus on certain things or, or you know, a lab manager that's, that's trying to apply their will to what you should focus on. But the fact is, it's still up to you. Now, I realize at some point you may look at that and go, well, yeah, right. I, I can't, I can't not do what the, what the PI says. I can't not do what, you know, what the, the study leader says. Like, and I want to say to you right now, of course you don't have to listen to that. You don't have to do anything. Now, I'm not saying that there's no consequences to that. You know, when you tell some, when somebody's complaining about their job and you say, well, why don't you just quit? And they'll tell you, well, I can't do that. Like, Yes, you can. Of course you can. You're not a slave. They don't have to sell you in the marketplace. Now, that doesn't mean it's not without consequences. It doesn't mean now your ch children won't go hungry. And some of those consequences can be pretty ugly, but there's still, it's still an option. You still get to choose where, where you're going to, what you're going to do. And the same thing is true with focus. So at the end of the day, focus is about assigning importance and you get to make that assignment. And if you make good choices there, your your career progresses well. And when you make bad choices, if you learn from that, you make better choices going forward. And now you're you can wield your focus in a more powerful fashion. So there's there's one last notion I want to put out there, and perhaps you've heard the about um, be do have. Those are three ways to look at the world. There's what are you being, what are you doing, what do you have? Now, people at the most basic levels of self-awareness, they're focused on what they have. They're focused on the stuff in their world. They, they care about, you know, what car do I have? What clothes do I have? What house do I have? What job do I have? It, the having is what's the most important to them. But if you get a little more effective at this, you will move from have to do. So you start thinking about how am I going to do my job? How, you know, what am I going to do in my, my career, in my world, in my relationships? So you change your focus from what you have to what you do. And you may re even redefine who you think you are. When you get to the third step, you focus on what you're being. So when you think of focus, you probably you might think of maybe I have focus. That's, that's not bad. But if you do focus, if you decide where to apply it, that's even better. But how about this? What if you can be focused? That's not normally how we think about these verbs. We talk, think about having or doing them. But you do have the option to be focused. You can be a shining example of focus. You can be someone whose who's incisive um, understanding of things is apparent all around them. That kind of focus is going to take you far. And 
it'll open your eyes to all kinds of things that might not be available to people who are doing focus or having focus. If you can be focused, you're going to do much better and have more opportunities. And it's going to be very expansive for your career. And in the laboratory specifically, especially when you have things that could be dangerous, you have things that could be, um, you know, where the, you could make very big mistakes, expensive mistakes, time consuming mistakes. Focus is truly key. So any, uh, any thoughts you'd like to add there, Nick? Yeah, I'm scribbling away, and um, <laughs> I so wish I'd you, I'd seen this thing when I was uh, in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually of what of all of the things that you've that, that I've heard from you. This is one of the most applicable to to what's going on in cult, in the lab culture, as, as I've uh, you know as far as I've seen and I hear from other people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that you start off, well, for me anyway, I started off inspired to do uh, a, a worthy job, to be a scientist, to, um, to, to help, to do uh, good work, um, to build a career and so on. And then, I, then my focus switched to something else which made me not want to be a scientist anymore or not enjoy it anymore, first of all, then limp along and limp along and then not want to do it anymore. And the switch was various things like and this is what i was scribbling away it's i switched from um focusing on what inspired me i switched into in that instead i switch uh, i switched into what annoyed me you know what, what <laughs> kind of irritated me about that job um, um i switched from um what is my ultimate path that i want to um you know focus on what, what is my ultimate path and instead of that, I switched to, you know, what do I want to be as a scientist? What's my aspiration? What's keeping me going here? And instead, I switched to how much my supervisor annoyed me and he was, he was a bully and he was this and he was that, <laughs> you know? And instead of, well, okay, he's a bully, but I'm still, this is a, there's a bigger picture here for me. That's what I could have done. I switched to, um, from focusing on what is working and what could work. And instead, I focused on what, what is not working you know what what experiments work, weren't working and to kind of convince myself that i just wasn't good at this but it's because i was focusing on you know being pulled down the rabbit hole it, it's interesting it, it, it's quite timely i was reading a book about this yesterday but what you focus on is what you get you, you, exactly what you're saying here. and the ultimate one again it always comes back to is you go in as a scientist to ask questions and you end up focusing on getting results, and that changes the whole perspective. And yeah, well, everything comes back to that for me and these things. But that, that's that was um, quite illuminating. That that there is the culture to um, not just in the lab, but because the lab's quite a crucible environment. You know, it's quite it's quite intense. Um, then. It's quite, it seems to be quite easy to flip that focus into, into negatives, which then reduces your enjoyment, reduces your output and, 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 and whatnot. Sure. Well, you know, if you're working in a lab, you have chosen a, uh, a hard road. You, you, you've decided to do something challenging. Yeah. And, you know, don't forget, you made, you made that choice a while at some point. And you made that commitment. And by the way, you deserve praise for that. That That is awesome. A lot of people don't do anything hard in their lives or they do everything to try and avoid it. But you didn't do that. But now, now that you've made those choices, you can still backslide into that notion of just focusing on problems, barriers, and failure. You know, <laughs> um, And if, if that's all you worry about, if that's where you put all your attention, it's, it comes back to you. And again, this this notion of our, our focus will create our world. We are always seeing things from a certain perspective, but you can you can mold and control that perspective because we can't see everything that's happening all at once, all the time. It's it's not practical. We have our limitations. We only have so many so much bandwidth 
so much brain power to, to apply it in a given moment. And if it's like if, um, folks that have photographic memory, they, they've been they've been studied. And what they find about people with photographic memory is not necessarily what you th what you'd expect. A lot of us think, man, I wish I had photographic memory. I just get frustrated when I forget things because, well, the, the problem is what actually happened was you focused on something. People with photographic memory have difficulty focusing on anything. They have a hard time seeing what is important in their view. I'm looking around the room right now and there's a lot to see here, but the only thing that's important right now is the computer that's in front of me. You know, I need to see the slide that I'm showing right now. I don't need to see the paperwork that's lying behind my computer. I don't need to see the other stuff that's on the table here. None of that matters. But somebody with, with photographic memory would have a hard time picking out what's important in any given moment. So presuming you don't suffer from that as a malady, you do have a choice. And and you can make that work for you. And it can be, we can be really be drawn to focus on the negative things. It can be, it can feel really compelling. But if you give yourself the chance to focus on things that are positive rather than negative, and I don't mean just in a Pollyanna way, but when you can start looking for solutions and start looking for, for uh, uh, ways around things and through things and past things, that is a far better place to focus your attention. Because if you can protect yourself from failing, there's no guarantee you will succeed. You will just, you will just see, just protect yourself from failing. And by the way, you won't perfectly accomplish that. You'll still fail sometime. But how likely are you to succeed? If you don't give some attention to it, some focus to success, it is not likely to happen. You know, there, there's a saying that every once in a while, even a, a blind squirrel finds a nut. Is that really how you want to live your career? You know, <laughs> or only every once in a while you you make some progress, you get to some to some place you wanted to get to. You're better off just to to constantly looking for ways to succeed with some occasional failures sprinkled in there. They they're unlikely to kill you. You're going to get past them. You'll learn things from them, and they will feed future successes. But focus is the tool you will use to get there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just uh, it just popped into my mind that uh, we, as well, the, the book I was reading yesterday, it's called The the, Su the Subtle Art of Not Giving an F Star Star Star. I don't know if you've <laughs> seen that. It keeps popping up in my Audible all the time, and, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to read that. And um, or listen to it. Um, it's quite an interesting take <laughs> on things. But one of the uh, one one of the things that pops out here, right? And again, I'm just applying this to my experience of being a scientist for ten years, and starting off with massive aspiration and off we go, and then allowing myself to be worn down by the negative side, right? And sure. and and missing it. You know, I miss I miss the, the part of me that still want, would like to follow that aspiration kind of does miss that but anyway what they say what he says in that book one of, or one of the things he says in that book is that um you always have problems right and all you can do is convert your problems from bad problems to to slightly better problems or, or better problems and that's what you're trying to do yeah. and if you better quality problems <laughs> that, that's that's i think that might be actually the phrase he uses higher quality problems <clears throat> And um, the analogy he used was that people who uh, are, are, you know, got a six pack and all this stuff and super fit people and all that, they have had the focus on the result that they want from that. But just as importantly, they are willing to bear the pain that it takes to get there. And so then they convert their problem from being unfit and feeling bad about themselves and all that stuff into having a workload and an, a certain amount of pain to deal with, but they're they're prepared to accept that pain, and that is what's allowed them to get there. And so, part of what's going on, uh, so so there's an there's an aspiration, and then there's a pain, a workload, and a pain load to get the payoff. Okay, and you have to accept all of that. Right. And 
the, the analogy that I would see is that for, for myself, I had the, in, as a scientist, I had the aspiration to be a scientist, but I wasn't willing to accept the, the pain threshold that was required there to achieve that. And, and, and I, I, or I focused in the wrong way that made the pain more acute or something like that. I don't know. What do you think about it? Well, yeah, the, if we focus on pain, uh, I, I guarantee you, you're going to stop whatever it is that's causing that pain. And that may not be in your long-term interest. You know, if if all you're focused on is you're sitting there, as you're pounding away on that stationary bike, is I'm not enjoying cupcakes right now. I could be having a burrito. I, you know, you're, that suffering is going to stop you. Yeah. Whereas if your focus can be on, okay, what is, I'm enjoying the, the zone I'm in right now. I, I feel the burn. I feel the, I feel like I can I can manage this. This is a this is a level that I can take. It's worth the cost. I uh, you know we can that inner dialogue is something we do have some say so over. Now, one thing about it is that inner dialogue just shows up. It's not like you sit there and and decide which thought's going to show up. Hmm. But when a thought shows up, you do have you can then make the choice. Right now. Am I going to foster this? Am I going to nurture this? Or am I going to tell this to, you know, hit the showers? <laughs> you know, I don't want to listen to that right now. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and, and whine and, you know, I'm not at McDonald's instead I'm at the gym. I, I don't want to do that. So you let that one go. Something else comes by and it's like, I'm feeling sweaty and gross. So, yeah. I don't to worry about that right now either. Or, and then a thought comes by like, you know what? I, I think I can keep going. I'm, I, can, I can do another five minutes. You know, you, you start making those choices. And as you make better choices, you know, things improve. And focus precedes that. First, you have to focus on what is the thought that's coming by. And then you have to focus on what is the impact of that thought. Because some thoughts, the impact is detrimental. Some thoughts, it's supportive. It, it, and it's up to you to choose that. You get your inner inner world and inner dialogue is yours. Nobody else nobody else can tell you about that. It's yours. You don't you don't have to listen to anybody else's opinion about it. You get to do what you're going to do, and you will build more strength, more power, more will to to approach the things you find to be important. And and that's that's up to you. And focus again is is the tool you have to apply because if you are unfocused things will get chaotic things will get disrupted they'll get disorganized and that that is not not the way to get things done <laughs> yeah so I, again I, i'm applying this to the being a scientist you know my own experience of which is all i have well and speaking <laughs> as well i suppose is you know you start off with aspiration inspiration off we go and you're, you're doing things um, the two things that, that kind of really ground me down were um, you, you working with supervisors who didn't do things the way that you thought that I thought they should do. Okay, and so then I get fixed, fixed it in my head. I don't want to work with people like this. I don't want to be in this. I don't want to work with people like this. And I can focus on that, which is what I did, and then it kind kind of ground me down over time. Or I could switch over to look. This is a necessary pain. And the same is I don't want to listen to the drill instructor telling me that I need to do another 30 press-ups. But if I want to get fit in a certain way, then I have to do that. And, and the aspiration is more important. You know, part of the aspiration is, or achieving the aspiration is accepting that, that there's that, that that's a payoff, you know, and, and being mm -hmm. okay with it. And, and, and enjoying it maybe if you can, as you know, the people who enjoy the gym or whatever. Right. Uh, another thing for me was, and this is an interesting one, is, Okay, being confident that I can do this stuff, I'm I'm intelligent enough, I've done all the, you know, I've passed all the exams and whatnot. But then experiments don't work. Or so an experiment doesn't work. Okay. And and you can just uh, instead of thinking, well, that's just what happens, just get back on, do it again, figure it out, do it again, do it again, and perfect it, perfect your craft. It's easy for it to go into a, well, I I'm not good at this. You know, you start <laughs> giving yourself that negative dialogue, so you then spiral up for yourself so that um you are 
convincing yourself that the the the, 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 the negative focus is the more important, the more real one, maybe, mm. or, or um, more important one. Boy, that's that'll be a, a topic for a whole podcast right there. <laughs> How I always say that uh, optimists never claim to be realists. Pessimists always claim to be realists. Guess what? They're not. And neither one is. Realism is something different than pessimism or optimism. But optimism certainly has its benefits. In pessimism, it's hard to make a case for it being valuable, other than, you know, it saves you from the worst at the worst moments. That's about all it's got going for it. You know, <laughs> and and it doesn't necessarily do a great job of it either. Because again, the focus as a just a as a neutral tool is great, but a focus that is using some of these other characteristics, like how can I be more realistic in my focus, and how can I be more more optimistic in my focus? There's benefits there, but rarely are you looking at things going. How would it be more beneficial to be pessimistic in my focus? It's just not going to be so. You know, don't don't waste the tool. You should try living in Scotland. That's the ultimate <laughs> pessimism. As you know. Anyway, uh, I'm sure there's worse. But um, yeah. So how do we? If, unless anyone, if anyone has any questions that they want to put in the chat box here, in the questions box there, I think. Uh, but feel free to do that. But I think we will wind this back around towards. So, what is some actionable advice for people? Who are on? Who are listening to this live or, or recorded? Um, to how can they apply this to to uh, to improve their their achievement in their career, but also their enjoyment of their career? Sure. Well, I think one of the points that we were making here is understand the difference between focus and focusing. Don't get caught in in the I'm trying to focus. I'm I'm, I'm focusing a little more than I was a moment ago. Instead of just focus, be done. Don't don't just do it a little better than you were before when you weren't doing it at all. <laughs> you know, start looking for endpoints. Drive things to their completion. Take it to the next step, and then keep going. Then do the next one and the next one. And and another thing to do is to to listen to your inner dialogue, and is is your inner dialogue being a supportive friend or is it being a, a naysayer? Is it, is it being a heckler from the crowd? What is it actually helping or not? And, and then make the choice whether or not you're going to allow that to keep being the way it is. Now, I'm not saying that it's necessarily easy to let go of the heckler because some of these hecklers are quite insistent, <laughs> but if, if you develop the habit of telling them sit down and shut up, <laughs> they will. And you know, cause it's just, you're just having this conversation with yourself. You know, I'm not saying you should, you should be doing this with your boss or with your peers, but um, with yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yourself, you, it's all about you. You get, to, you get to be in charge of that. So those are some of the things that come to mind off the top of my head. <laughs> So we have a, a question in from Barry who's saying that um, since there are a lot of things to focus on, what should we focus on most when we're in the lab? Yeah. Ah. Well, I would say that that's something that you should have done before that question came up. And the thing you should have done before that is choose your priorities. Now, once you have your priorities set, now it becomes clear, well, what should I focus on? Um, because that, that'll call out, this is what matters right now. Now, you may have a, a setting where we really need to focus on safety. Yeah, that's a high priority. We need, we need to focus on on um, protecting our materials or, or our tissues or whatever it is we're working with because we have a limited supply. Uh, when you have that focus in mind, it'll become clear. Well, I got to be more careful here. I got to take more time. I've got to have more safeties in place. I got to ask for more resources. Um, I've got to, I've got to inform other people 
about this so that they don't ab- you know accidentally stumble stumble into causing harm. You know that'll that'll call your priorities. Then will call focus into mind. Now, if you don't have that a necessity like that, if you can be more more freewheeling, more discovery focused, more creative about it, well, knowing that that's an option, now you are free to uh, to allow your focus to be uh, operating uh, to operate in a in a, a larger environment. And when you know you have that freedom, well, now you know you can, I can reach out. I can think outside the box. I can ask for other involvement from people that have different perspectives. You know, that all of that will help inform where your focus should be. But in the moment, sometimes like, look, I'm in a restricted environment and I had to, I have to pay attention to that. And so none of it's good or bad. It you could have a very open environment and a very close environment. You could have a very safe environment. And you could have a very dangerous environment. Um, you could have a very risky environment. You could have a very safe environment. None of the none of the environments are automatically good or bad. They're just what they are. And being aware of them will help you choose how to focus. Okay. So we have another question in from Olha. <laughs> I might be able to answer this one. <laughs> How to how should, how can you focus on writing your PhD thesis if you've already started your new job? I did exactly the same thing. Started a new job before writing my thesis, and it was a very difficult. It took me a long time. It was a very difficult thing to do. And I was going to say to Barry's previous question that you're talking about mic not micro focuses, but in the moment focus focus. Mm-hmm. And and those are that's really important. But I also think you know looking at this for myself. It's maintaining a macro focus where you're like, why am I doing this? And and then when something presents itself, am I willing to bear the pain? Am I willing to do this as a necessary pain? I'm going to do it just like I'm training for a marathon, so I'm going to have to run a certain amount of miles to be ready to run the marathon. And am I willing to bear that pain? And sure. for all this, for all this um, uh, question there, how to focus on stay focus as in how to how to stay motivated i would say is stay focused on why you want to finish that thing you know yeah. why did you do this what is the bigger thing and then then ask yourself are you willing to bear the pain that is going to take you and what the, the the answer probably is that you are uh, it probably will be that you are because you've got this far but what will hold you back because what held me back <laughs> was complaining about it all the time that I don't want to do yeah. that. But if you if you say, well, this is a, if you say to yourself, this is a pain I'm willing to bear to get to this end result, then you can do it. And unlike me, I had to make myself, drag myself over the finish line by eating lots of chocolate biscuits to convince me to stay at the computer. That <laughs> had a really bad side effect, so don't do that. <laughs> well, yeah. one thing about this is, is understanding the difference between making a choice and making a decision. Because, if you're constantly reevaluating your choices, now you you chose to work toward a PhD. That was a big, big choice, a big commitment in your life. So now, though, you don't reassess that commitment every time you need to work on on your thesis. That that's already decided. You already decided I'm working toward this PhD. So now it's just decision time. Do I have the? Do I have? The resources I need. Do I have the? Uh, do I have the focus I need? Do I have? And you know, is this a good moment for me to be doing this? Because sometimes it isn't a good moment. But if you find yourself telling yourself all the time, "Well, I'm too tired," or "I've got a headache," or "I don't have all the materials I need," or "I," if you're constantly giving yourself excuses, you're. That's not. Those are not great decisions. So start. You start looking at yourself with self-respect and go, you know what? I'm a, a person of commitment. Mm-hmm. I made a commitment to a big project here. It is a big deal to get a PhD. Well, now that it's being the being the, the committed person you are, what would I do right now? What decision would I make right now? And maybe it's like, you know what? I'm gonna go take an aspirin and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get to work on this. I'm going to gather the materials I need. I'm going to head over to the library. I'm going to get on the internet. Whatever it is you've got to do in that moment. I've got to talk to the people I need to talk to. Take a step in the direction you want to go. 
Now, maybe you're telling yourself, I've got to write this thesis. Well, that's a pretty big picture. There's milestones along the way. And maybe right now, the next step is all you need to focus on. The only thing you need to do right now is turn on the computer. The only thing you need to do right now is make that phone call or send that email. Pick that thing out and then finish it. Don't, I'm writing the email. No, write it. Be done. Hit send. Move on. And then, and then ask yourself, what is the next step, the next task in front of me? You're not worried at that moment about the finished product. You, you made that commitment a while ago. That's already done. Right now, you need to focus on what's the next step. That's all. I always think you can learn a lot for these sort of things from professional athletes because they are people who have committed to something and they are overcoming the problems that stop most people from doing that level of exercise, right? And so yeah. w- one one of the, the things that always springs to mind, mind I always tell my kids <laughs> as well, is a, a cyclist. Uh, he was a Scottish cyclist. And one of the things he did was, so you wake up in the morning at six o'clock and you have your training session to do. And you can <clears throat> then make the, you make the decision, uh, am I going out or not? And if you're lying in bed, you, it's much harder to make the decision to get out. So what his, what he, all he made himself do was every morning he got up and he put his whole cycling gear on, got the bike, went outside, sat on the bike and then decided whether he was going or not. <laughs> it, took away, it took away the whole, um, took away the whole, uh, you know, the lazy part of you that wants to just go and watch something on TV or something like that instead. So if you can get yourself a retina, we'll have for, um, you know, scheduling your writing for a, you know, the, the same time every day or whatever you can, and just get a routine that says what I do is that I finish work and it's six o'clock to nine o'clock. Uh, that's my set aside time for writing or whatever it is. And all I've got to do is sit down, turn the computer on, get everything ready, start, and then see how it feels. And 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 and, and go. that's one way to overcome this sort of initial barrier. Yeah. I think Tim Ferriss wrote about that. You know, he was he needed to finish a book, and he was talking to a to a an experienced writer friend of his. And this friend of his told him that my goal is to write, and I forget the exact number, but it was like a thousand shitty words a day. That was his phrase. It didn't matter that it was good. It was meant just put them down, put it down on paper, put it down on the screen. I'll fix it later. But for right now, until you do something, until you start writing, you can't fix it. And if you're if you're just noodling in your head how to say it perfect, how to write write it perfect, you're, you're never going to get there. Write it imperfect. Start there, and pr- you can perfect it later. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, okay, and I'll just throw in that a, a little tangent to that. Not much of a tangent, but there's one of the best writing, pieces of writing advice I've ever had, which was. When you're writing the first draft, draft just write, don't stop. Yeah. Go back and fix it because you, you hold yourself up so much by thinking about every nuance and detail and whatnot. Yeah, don't worry about punctuation or spelling or grammar, any of that. Just dump it out there. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> you lose focus, Nick? No, I'm just reading. <laughs> uh, we'll just, just put another thing in. I'm just sitting in. Uh, try that. Yeah, okay, so Olga's saying that, uh, Olha, sorry, is saying that uh, currently she just feels so much that it's like a trial. Trials and chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I, know you're, I know the feeling. Um, and not so much focused work on the thesis. The more she tries, the more she becomes frustrated. This sounds like a you question, Ken. <laughs> well, I heard a couple of things in there. Um, well, first off, the notion of trying. The, re- if you want to really solve the problem of trying, I, I try so hard and I don't get it done. Replace the word try with fail. When you tell yourself, I'm trying to write my thesis, tell yourself, I'm failing to write my thesis. Wow, look at that. It's true. I am failing to write it. Because trying, again, it's got that ING on there. It, it doesn't get completed. And you can succeed at trying without actually succeeding because I tried didn't actually get anything done, but I tried forget about trying. 
it's 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 like Yoda had to say, you know, it's either do or do not do. <laughs> That's how and, you know, I see it. you're straying into Yoda now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, the other thing is, what story are you telling yourself about this? Because it's I'm trying and I'm suffering as I try, and it's so hard when I try. That that whole story takes on a life of its own. And it becomes the most important part. But it isn't the most important part. It it, it isn't isn't important at all. In fact, that story can completely go away and be replaced by a different story. So the the story is is not critical. So you got to ask yourself, what quality of story do I want to listen to all day? And especially when you're the storyteller, you're doing it to yourself, right? And I'm not saying that to be judgmental or mean about it. It's just to realize I am writing this story. I get to choose how the story goes. And then sometimes it does feel good to have the story have a bunch of challenge in it and excitement and be on the hero's journey and all that. You know, that that's that, that's not necessarily bad, but just be mindful about it and choose. Make make your focus be on a story that will support you and will will help you accomplish your end goal. Yeah, you can do it, Olga. Olga, you just uh, believe in yourself. You can do this. <laughs> And sometimes that sounds a little trite. Oh, just believe in yourself. Like, yeah. Well, you know what? You have had moments of believing in yourself, and it worked out well. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I know for sure you learned how to talk. You learned how to walk. You got some fundamental things. You got to figure it out. And there are occasionally some people that don't figure that stuff out. And, of course, you've taken it far, far and beyond that. You've had many, many accomplishments. Anybody that is working on a PhD or has got a PhD, I'm sorry, to claim that you're unaccomplished is ridiculous. Tell yourself a better story. You've accomplished a lot of things. And look at those look at those examples and go, well, how do I apply this next? How do I apply this in what I'm facing right now? When I'm gonna I'm gonna focus and in my focus I'm gonna apply a good story and I'm gonna take this forward. Okay. okay. Well I think that if there's no more questions, then uh, I think we'll just wrap up there. That was a really interesting one. I always find it funny when it's kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, I wish I'd had that one. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, and by the way, this is why we're doing this. Exactly. Yeah, Nick started Bite Size Bio because of all the problems he saw that people were encountering in the lab, and he felt like there was nobody out there helping them. Well, Bite Size Bio was born to help you. So here it is. Yeah, and then I realized that half of those problems were me. So there you go. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> but I have those. But that's the same is true for everybody who's on the listening end of this. So don't don't feel bad about it. Don't look at it and say, no. "Well, uh, if, if it wasn't for me, I wouldn't have this problem." Yeah, you and a bunch of other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's the good news is that if doing things like this, where you you can take heed of what you're saying here and switch around the, the what you're focusing on for example yeah then a lot of those problems will disappear um yes so, but it does take some practice yep well exactly so <clears throat> exercise the muscle <laughs> okay thank you ken that was uh very very insightful and uh thanks to you the audience for listening in whether that's live today or on demand later uh we hope that you find some benefit from the episode uh, you can look out for more from more Happy Scientist episodes in the coming months. You can find them listed on events.bitesizebio.com and at the Happy Scientist Facebook page at uh, facebook.com forward slash the Happy Scientist podcast or look up the Happy Scientist podcast on any of the streaming platforms to get uh, the, the podcast version. And there's lots of other, I don't know what episode this is now, but there yeah. are many, many wisdom-packed episodes in that uh, catalogue now. So, um, but until next time, until we do the next Happy Scientist Live, which I think will probably be in a few weeks, uh, good luck in your research and goodbye from all of us at Bite Size Bio, including Mr. Miyagi. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Happy Scientist podcast, helping you to become a happier, healthier, and more productive scientist. To get more Happy Scientist podcast episodes and all of our downloadables, please go to bitesizebio.com forward slash the happy scientist, all one word. And in particular, you might want to spend some time on episodes one to nine, where we talk about the foundational principles 
of human needs, core mindsets, and charisma factors, which we refer to in many episodes. You can also hook up with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Happy Scientist Podcast, all one word, to get latest episodes and additional material. We hope to see you there. The Happy Scientist is brought to you by Bite Size Bio, your mentor in the lab. Bite Size Bio features thousands of articles and webinars contributed by hundreds of PhD scientists and scientific companies who freely offer their hard-won wisdom and solutions to the Bite Size Bio community.